Tonight we will be continuing with our question and answers, and tonight we're only going to be looking at one question. Can Christians serve in the military? I'll go ahead and I'll read the, the entire question and we'll go from there. For many years, service in the U.S. military has been looked upon favorably by the vast majority of Americans, the, hip, the hippie movement of the 1960s notwithstanding. Yet, from a religious standpoint, there has been an ongoing controversy among members of the church as to whether a Christian can serve in the military and or fight in war. Many who support a position opposing Christian serving in the military turn to passages such as 2 Corinthians 10, 3-4. For though we walk uh, in the flesh, we do not walk after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not uh, carnal, but mighty through God to the uh, pulling down of our strongholds. <clears throat> Often they will point to the fact that Christianity allows no hatred or physical retaliation, such as Galatians 5.14, Romans 12.17-21, uh, through 21, and uh, Romans 13.9, Romans 12.19. Uh, uh, Many of our young ones are refusing to serve in our military for the aforementioned reasons. Uh, and, and just a, a point before we move on, I'm going to look at most of these verses that are mentioned, but I'm not going to look at all of them because some of them have uh, overlapping principles. But it might surprise you to know that the history of the uh, churches of Christ in the United States uh, are a history of pacifism. Uh, there have been many members of the Churches of Christ, especially in the early years, that were pacifists and refused to fight in war. Uh, many of these men, such as uh, Campbell, uh, Tolbert, and Fanning, and, and, and David, uh, excuse me, uh, Campbell, uh, Tolbert, Fanning, and David Lipscomb, all opposed Christians fighting in war. And it might surprise you to know that during World War I, one of the largest group of conscientious objectors, uh, ob conscientious objectors uh, were members of the Church of Christ. And this is unusual since uh, many members of the church uh, have participated in war or in the military or uh, served in the, mil uh, serve in the military to uh, some fu function uh, still today. Uh, now, the question indicates that there are growing numbers of Christians who are opposed to Christians serving in war. I don't know if that's the case. I haven't come in contact with many who are opposed uh, to Christians serving in war. I have met a, a small handful who uh, refuse to uh, join the military based off personal scruples, but not as something they find inherently sinful. But it's still an important question to ask. So is there an option for Christians to serve in the military today? Well, let's talk about a, a few definitions before we, we, we dive into the subject. Uh, what is war? Well, war is defined as an armed conflict between different nations or states or different groups within a nation or state, and a war can be fought for several different reasons. Uh, uh, for resources, uh, to take one example, uh, consider uh, our war with Japan in uh, World War II. Uh, when they were trying to conquer Asia to the best of their ability, we cut off their oil supply. We supplied 90% of their oil in order to get back at us and to get us to cooperate. Uh, they bombed Pearl Harbor. It was a war, at least against us, over resources. There are uh, many wars that are started simply over territory. Uh, sometimes over self-preservation. Uh, sometimes it's due to the ambition of uh, a, a ruler or a monarch. Uh, take Alexander the Great, for example. Uh, he conquered Asia because he wanted to be remembered the same way Achilles was remembered. Uh, there are sometimes war fought off, uh, based off uh, ideological motives or religious motives uh, as well. But... Uh, But the question remains, should a Christian uh, serve uh, in a, serve his, serve, should a Christian serve in, uh, should a Christian serve in this same function? Should a Christian have the option of going to war? Well, there, ha there has never been a situation in which God has condemned his servants uh, fighting for a lawful cause. Uh, let's consider Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis chapter 14, we see that uh, there is a certain situation in where four kings 
war against five uh, separate kings in the land of Canaan. And uh, in the process, that they, they conquer a portion of Canaan. They uh, kidnap the people uh, and their possessions. But some of the individuals they kidnap are, are, law, are Lot and uh, his family. And so Abraham responds. We see uh, in verse uh, 14, he takes uh, 318 of men trained in his house uh, to fight against these kings. We see in verses 15 through 16 that he str strategically divides his forces and overcomes his opponent, rescuing everyone. And we see in this scenario that he is not condemned for these actions. In fact, he's rewarded and blessed by God. If you will turn with me to Genesis chapter 14, uh, verses 15 through 16. It says, talking about Melchizedek and Abram, he, uh, it says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of the Most High God. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram uh, of God Most High, possessor of earth and heaven. And blessed be uh, God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. So we see a very early scenario in which uh, God used military action for his own benefit, and he used uh, his own servant to accomplish it. We also see that when the law of Moses was established, there were uh, many instances, instances in which, law, uh, which war uh, was justifiable. But there were several par parameters that many of the Israelites had to follow. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, uh, uh, in, in verse 10, we see that before they went out to battle uh, with the city, they first had to offer terms of peace. They had to offer them a chance to surrender. And they also offered many of the men a chance to return home. We see in verses 5 through 8, there were several reasons a man could avoid going to battle. Uh, if he had planted a vineyard or, or uh, constructed a new house or if he just got engaged, uh, he had the option of returning home. Or in uh, one case, as we see in verse 8, if he was afraid or terrified, he was not required to fight. And this is because we all know how uh, contagious fear is. I remember on one particular occasion, uh, we were experiencing some tornadoes in Alabama, and uh, me and my family and some family friends were all together in a basement, and we had a one four-year-old uh, with us who, whose name was Jim, and he saw all of us huddled in a basement. He knew this wasn't uh, how we normally did things, and he was kind of concerned, and he looked at me to see how I was reacting, and I knew if I was to cry or panic, uh, he would panic too. So I just smiled and laughed, and he smiled and laughed, and he was fine the whole night. Uh, we're, we're constantly looking at each other's reactions, and if one person is fearful, everyone else gets fearful. And this is true also on the battlefield. Uh, and so we see that uh, uh, in reference to the Old Testament, uh, war was uh, in many cases justified. And many of the Israelites, if they met certain qualifications, were expected to fight in battle. Uh, some of the greatest men in the Old Testament were warriors. Uh, take Joshua and David, uh, for instance. Uh, but they still had this concept of a just war. They knew they couldn't go to war just because they felt like it. Uh, if you want to, you can uh, look at Psalm uh, chapter 7, verses 4 through 5. David understood that he could not simply go to war uh, for resources or for more territory. He had to have a just cause. He says, starting uh, halfway through verse 4, If I have plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. We see that David understood that there were just reasons for go to war. He knew he could not attack his enemy without cause. And he says, if I have... Let my enemy take me. Let my enemy kill me. Let him throw my glory to the ground. And we know that many of the men in the Old Testament who uh, served in, in difficult situations uh, did not always follow their commander if their commander asked them to do something that was unethical or unjust. Uh, take 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 17. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 17. 
we see on one particular occasion uh, the King Saul is upset with uh, these priests who helped David. And they didn't realize David was running from the king, so they, they helped him. But Saul didn't like this very much, so he ordered his soldiers to execute them. But they didn't. They refused. They knew that they could not slaughter the servants of God simply because their king told them to. They could go to war on, on a just means, but they couldn't do whatever their king told them to do. Unfortunately, as we see in verse 18, Doag did not have the same uh, moral standard that they did. So we see throughout the whole Old Testament and the patriarchal law and the law of Moses, uh, men uh, could and sometimes were expected to serve in war. But what does the New Testament have to say about this? Well, let's look at Luke chapter 10, verse 14. Luke chapter 10, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 3, verse 14. Now, we see on this particular occasion, there are several uh, groups of people coming to John the Immerser. We see the first set uh, in verse uh, 10 and 11. Uh, just a group of general people coming to John the Immerser. They're asking him, uh, all right, we want to follow God, but what will we do? Or what should we do? And he says, we'll be generous. If you have two tunics, give one tunic to someone who doesn't have it. Then we see eventually a group of tax collectors come. And he says, well, what are we expected to do? And uh, John the Immerser says, well, do not collect any more money than what you're supposed to. And then we see in verse 14, it says, Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, What about us? What shall we do? He said to them, uh, Do not take money from anyone by force, or accuse anyone falsely, and be content with your wages. Uh, and keep in mind that these are Roman soldiers. Uh, these are men serving uh, in Galilee and in Judea, trying to keep the peace. Now, if... God was trying to establish a new covenant where uh, his followers were not expected to serve in the military. This would be the time to institute this law. But John the Immerser says nothing about their service. He simply says, one, do not take anyone's money by force. Do not falsely accuse anyone. And be content with your, with your wages. So it seems that God... Uh, uh, had no issue with men ever, even now, uh, with his followers serving in war. If this would have been the this would have been the time to point out that things were going to be different, but John the Immerser doesn't. He says, "Just keep doing what you're doing. Just make sure, sure what you what you do, you do it in the right way." We also see Paul in uh, Philippians chapter one, Philippians chapter one, verses uh, twelve through thirteen. Uh, Paul lets us know that uh, the gospel was reaching those in the Praetorian Guard. Uh, some of your translations may say the Imperial Guard. This was the uh, group of elite soldiers that were serving the emperor. Uh, there's no indication that, that Paul wanted them to repent or desired for them to relinquish uh, their position. So we see from uh, both John the Immerser and from Paul that God had no issue with his followers serving uh, in, in the military. But let's look at a few of the passages that were given at first that some are using to support this idea that Christians should not serve in the military. Let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. Now, uh, initially, only two verses are given, verses 3 through 4, but I want us to look at the whole context. Paul writes, Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walk according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction, for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations, 
and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience uh, whenever your obedience is complete. Now, we need to consider the context of 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians is a very interesting letter because all the way through, Paul has to defend his apostleship because there were many people at the church at Corinth who didn't really like Paul. Uh, they said some really nasty things behind his back. They said, oh, yeah, his letters are, are bold and, and very forward. But when he's here with us, he doesn't really preach that well. He doesn't have a strong presence. And if you notice in verse 1, uh, he's sort of using that statement against them. In this context, Paul isn't really talking about war. Uh, he's talking about how uh, he may live in the flesh and, and he may live a, as a person, but, you know, his duty is uh, to, uh... Now, let me rephrase that. Paul's saying, yes, you know, I'm a man of the flesh, but my teaching, the truths that I bring uh, are not my authority. They're not things that uh, I'm doing because uh, uh, I want to, but they're from God. They're from God's authority. Uh... Now let's also look at Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. This is a, another passage that is uh, sometimes used uh, to uh, say that Christians should not uh, serve in the military. We'll start at verse uh, 17, Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 17. Paul writes, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so... You will reap uh, burning coals on his head. Uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, first off, this passage is not talking about war. This is talking about uh, our personal relationships with each other. But I think we could agree that these uh, principles do apply uh, even in a, a militaristic situation. Let's consider uh, verse 17. Paul says, never pay back evil with evil. Well, not all war is evil. Sometimes war, if it's done for the right reasons, is just and it's good. And it's to defend those who can't defend themselves. It's to preserve one's nation or people. Now let's consider verse 18. Paul writes, if it lies with us, live at peace with all men. And we should have this attitude. And I think even nations should have this attitude to try to get along with everyone to the best of their ability. But unfortunately, not everyone wants peace. Paul says, as much as it lies with you, you might want peace. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people in this world uh, who do not want peace. Uh, with some radical groups in the, in the Middle East, there is a common phrase they say sometimes before they die. It is that we love death more than you love life. And the idea is that, yeah, we're okay with dying and we're going to bring you down with us. It's unfortunate that they have that attitude because we want to do what Paul says. We want to be at peace with all men. Now let's consider verse 19. Paul writes to never take your own revenge because revenge belongs to God. And this is true when it comes to uh, how we personally live our lives. We should never seek our own revenge or our own justice. But a war is not about one's personal vendetta. At least it should not be. Uh, war is ideally in a just situation about self-preservation. Uh, but let's consider this idea of a God's vengeance. Can God use war to execute his vengeance? Let's consider a chapter 13, verse 4. Chapter 13, verse 4. Paul writes, talking about the government, For it is a minister of God to you for good. 
But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, of, uh, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Now, of course, in one sense, this is talking about uh, the legal system. And it's talking about how uh, God has put governments in place so that they can execute justice. And they can execute wrath as his avenger on those who are wicked. But God, throughout history, has used wars to accomplish his goal, even for his own vengeance. Uh, consider the book of Daniel. We see in Daniel chapter 1, God uses the Babylonians to punish Israel for their wickedness. We see in Daniel chapter 5 that God uses the Medo-Persians to uh, punish uh, the Babylonians for their wickedness. Now, I'm not saying that, that nations should uh, try to decide who needs to be punished and who doesn't need to be punished. But if we're fighting a just war, perhaps God is using us or using another nation to punish a wicked nation. Because as we see, the, the, the government in place by him is supposed to be his avenger. In verse 20, it says, we have an obligation to feed our enemies. Uh, uh, often, it, thankfully, in modern wars, uh, at least by Western powers, it's uh, very common for uh, Western nations when they go to war with another to send humanitarian aid to the civilians of their enemies. And I, I think this is a Christian principle. Uh, look at verse 21. It says, overcome evil with good. Now, I know uh, when we think of war, we, we never think of that as a good thing. Uh, because whether we like it or not, there, there's something unnatural about it. It's never a good thing when people who wear the image of God slay other people who wear the image of God. It, it's a very grave and it's a very sad thing. But as God acknowledges all throughout Scripture, sometimes it is necessary. And sometimes it is a moral good. It's morally a good thing to preserve the lives of those who we love, to preserve the, the, the liberty and the culture of our, nat of our nation. Uh, there's always this idea in Scripture about uh, fighting for what is right and fighting for those who cannot defend themselves. Uh, consider what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, he says, Learn to do good, seek justice. Reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. There's this idea all throughout Scripture that those who are strong should defend those who are weak and who should reprove the ruthless when, when it comes down to it. Uh, we as Christians uh, should never enjoy the idea of war. Uh, it should be something we try to avoid at all costs. It should be, that, it should be something that nations try to avoid at all cost. But it doesn't mean that we have to be pacifists. It doesn't mean that we have to be opposed to joining into war. I'd like to read you a few quotes from uh, Genshin Funakoshi. Uh, I think he really puts things in perspective when it comes to, to standing up for what is right. Uh, Genshin Funakoshi is considered the uh, father of modern day karate. He was the one who brought uh, karate from Okinawa to Japan. And many of these Okinawan masters of karate were pacifists to a great degree. Many of them would avoid all conflict at all cost, except when it was absolutely, ne de uh, absolutely necessary. He said to win a hundred victories and a hundred battles is not the highest skill. To subdue the enemy without fighting is the highest skill. The way he looked at it is that if there's ever a conflict, if there's ever any issue, the best way to do it is without any type of damage to, to, to yourself or your opponent. But he also understood that there were times when there were no other options. He also said, he who would study karate do must always strive to be inwardly humble and outwardly gentle. However, once he has decided to stand up for the cause of justice, then he must have the express saying, even if it must be 10 million foes, I must go. And I believe this is the attitude that Christians have. We shouldn't like conflict. We shouldn't like for war, but we must accept that. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it is necessary. Now, before I conclude, 
I would like to say just a, just a few things. Uh, no Christian is required to serve in the military, at least not usually. Perhaps a Christian might live in a nation where military service is required. We live at a time where things are relatively peaceful. If one wants to join the military, that is up to one's own personal decision. Uh, none of us are required to do so. But I think if one wants to join the military, I think there are some things to consider. Uh, our nation uh, has a history of doing a lot of wonderful things. Unfortunately, our nation also has a history of doing a lot of terrible things. And there may come a time in the future where we're fighting a war that is not just, or we're fighting a war that is not appropriate for us to be in. And it's up for the Christian to decide, is this a war I can participate in? Is this something that is just? Is this, a, is this something that is right in the sight of God? And that's for the Christian to decide. Uh, another thing to consider is that the environment one is, one is in when one joins the military. I, uh, I uh, learned with a guy uh, in school. Uh, his name was uh, Will Brown, and he's an excellent preacher. And he said he served in the Army for many years. And he says, I don't encourage every single Christian to join the military. I only, I only encourage a few because your faith has to be so strong. Sometimes you're put in very difficult situations, and it can be a challenge to your spirit and your faith. On top of that, you're, all, you're, you're often placed in the vicinity of uh, immoral influences that, that can uh, tempt you in a very negative way. So when it comes to deciding if one should join the military, I think one has to consider their maturity and their faith, and if they can withstand the temptations that it may bring. Uh, but as we can see, Scripture never condemns uh, the servants of God fighting in a just war or, or serving their military in, in, in an uh, ethical fashion. Now, this is uh, our, our last question for tonight. Uh, we uh, uh, always are always looking for more questions. Or we're starting to run out, so if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to uh, write down a question or type it out, put it in the box, and uh, we would love to answer it uh, maybe next time around. But before we conclude, we would like to uh, offer the invitation to all whom it may apply. If there's someone here tonight who is... Uh, not yet a Christian, someone who's not yet obedient to the gospel, and you know what is required and you're willing to repent of your sins and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're willing to confess him as such, we would love to baptize you. And through that, God will forgive you of all your sins and Christ will add you to his church. And if there's anyone here tonight who was once obedient to the gospel but is no longer living in a manner pleasing to God, we would love to pray for you. And God certainly will forgive you. Or if you simply need prayers of encouragement, we would love to pray for you about anything you may need. If there's anything we can do for you spiritually, please come forward as we stand and sing. <laughs>